This morning is uh, the first Sunday of Lent, and, and it's the beginning of what could be a journey for us, which takes us from here right through until Easter. It's a time for reflection and a time for prayer. And today I hope to look at or th at least think about how we could journey to get to know God better, to get closer to him. So our call to worship this morning um, is from Jeremiah. It says this. If you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord. So, Lord, today we come. We come and we seek you. We come to offer you our worship, our prayers. We come to offer you ourselves this morning. Lord, hear us. Speak to us. Be with us during this service today. Amen. And our first hymn this morning is going to be Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. Let's pray together. Great God, 
in Christ you call our name and then receive us as your own not through some merit, right or claim, but by your gracious love alone. Lord, this morning we come before you, amazed at your love for us, amazed that you know all there is to know about us as we were created by you. Great God, we thank you that you can give our lives purpose, that we can be part of your great plan if we but seek you and trust in you. Loving God, we praise you that we can put our hand into yours, knowing that you will lead, support and hold us throughout our lives, that you will supply all our needs and pour out abundant blessing on us. We praise you for all the times we have experienced your presence, the times when we have been aware of you holding us, times when we know that you haven't let us go, even when we let go of you. And Lord, forgive us that we do let go so often, intent on going our own way, not trusting in you and clinging to what ultimately can never satisfy us. Forgive us when we are weak and when we give in to the things of the world instead of looking to you. Forgive us for doubting you when times are hard, for questioning your ability to lead us safely through. And forgive us, Lord, for only crying out to you as a last resort, only calling out to you when we need you. Help us to put a hand in yours again in simple trust, in quiet confidence, and in expectation, knowing that whatever we face and wherever we find ourselves, you will hold on to us and have us firmly in the palm of your hand. Father, in a moment of silence, we just lay at your feet the things that we need to confess to you, the things we want to unburden ourselves with. Lord, we give these things to you now. Loving God, you reach out to us with compassion and with mercy and for your forgiveness, because we have seeked you, Lord, we thank you. Lord, help us today, in this time of worship, to focus on you, to hear you speak to us, to feel your presence, and to know your love in new ways, deeper ways, we pray. In Jesus' name, accept our prayers. Amen. Amen. We're going to have our two readings now, and Pippa's going to read the first one from Psalms and Paul, the second one from the Gospel of Matthew. Thank you. Psalm 91, verses 1, 2, and 9 to 16. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, 
He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I, I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. A reading from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Thanks be to God for his word. Our next song is Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be your name. 
I want to share with you today um, something that I have shared once before many, many years ago, but I think very striking at the moment. So in the first chapter of the Bible, in the first chapter of Genesis, we see the wonder of creation. Starting with chaos, God creates order. God speaks and things appear. And God declares that everything is good. By the sixth chapter of Genesis, though, very, very short way into the Bible, we read that the Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great, that their hearts were evil. And we read that God was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. The actions of humankind broke God's heart. And out of grief, the Lord decides to take action. He doesn't react angrily, but he is moved out of love to restore what he's made. And he decides to wash the earth clean and both God and the earth begin again. God takes what he had, flawed, broken human beings, and gives them a new beginning. We read about God sending a great flood and Noah embarking on a journey into the unknown. Noah had no knowledge of the sea. He had no science, no maps, no experience. All he had was a, prov a profound faith to guide him. Now, I can't imagine, as none of us can, what Noah's journey in that ark were like. I can't believe that he didn't have doubts, that he didn't have anxieties. But we are told that he remained faithful to the task that God had given him. And through his journeying, Noah discovered a God of love, a God who wanted a deep and binding relationship with him and with all those who want to know him and truly seek him. But despite the events and the experiences of Noah, humankind did not change, did not learn, did not turn from wickedness, did not embrace a loving God. We continually failed and we still fail. We still fall victim to Satan's temptations. We still find ourselves in a wilderness place, a place of isolation and separation from God. But, you know, God cannot let us go. His love for his creation for us is too great. And so what was God's solution? Ultimately, Jesus came. He came because of sin. He came because of that wickedness that we saw in Genesis still persists. He came because he loved us so much that he couldn't bear to leave us without a solution to a problem we could not solve. But throughout human history, from the, the issue of the apple in the Garden of Eden, humankind has gone its own way, it's refused to follow God's rules. And because of that, we are unworthy. We are unable to enter God's holy place. God could not look on any of us because we are stained by sin. And the relationship that is so precious to God is broken because we look away from him. We have the same 
age old problem that the people of God had in the Old Testament. And we cannot fix this separation ourselves. So God shows us himself in Jesus. Jesus comes to combat sin and to restore us to a loving God. Jesus has bridged the gulf and made it possible for us to go to where God is if we put our trust and our faith in him. The whole reason for Jesus's journey to the cross was so that we could journey to heaven. Jesus journeyed from heaven to earth, carrying all the purposes of God. And he then traveled the lonely, agonizing road to the cross, carrying the sins of all of us. What do you think kept Jesus strong enough to face such a difficult road? Let's think back to our gospel reading where we see Jesus starting out on his ministry. After his baptism, he is taken into the desert, into the wilderness. It is a turning point for him where he has to seek his father, seek his purpose. We can see all the trials and the difficulties that Jesus faced at that time. He's in a desolate place. There is loneliness, there is isolation, there is hunger. And there he meets the greatest adversary of all. He meets Satan, who tries for 40 days to bring Jesus down, to bring Jesus to his knees. Jesus identifying with our struggles. But Satan fails in the case of Jesus. And why? Because Jesus was not alone. We are told that the angels took care of him. God's presence and support were there, close at hand. God acting as the light at the end of the tunnel, the hope in the struggle. What a dynamic picture of the human life. Like the floods of Noah, God washes us clean, takes the old us and makes us something new. God brings us into a new relationship with him through Jesus through Jesus combating temptation and ultimately death. Order is created out of chaos and hope springs up out of despair. And for us too, when the troubles and the temptations come, when Satan jeers, God is there to provide us with all we need to overcome. But are we close enough to God to be strong enough to withstand the evil of the world around us? Getting close to God was important for Jesus. So even more so for us, surely. Have you ever stopped to think about why we find mountains so attractive? They are things of majestic beauty, but does our relationship with them go deeper than just our appearance? We talk about the mountaintop experience, don't we? But what is it that makes those experiences so special? Is it because we still have a childlike idea that puts God up in heaven? So going up a mountain makes us feel that we're getting closer to God. Whatever it is, the mountaintop has always played an important part in human spirituality. Whether it's the Celtic mystics who built their standing stones on hilltops, or the Hindu holy man who sits alone on the hill and meditates day and night, or the monks in central Greece that built their monasteries 
on inaccessible pinnacles of rocks. And we're gonna see some photographs as we go through our service of these amazing structures. It was in the 14th century that there were many, many more of these amazing buildings, but six have endured the test of time and can still be seen today. And they are collectively called the Meteora. The story goes that access to these monasteries was originally and deliberately very difficult. A hard climb, a pilgrimage, a fast, they're all ways of denying ourselves and letting God in. The monks would use either long lazars lashed together or a large net to climb the almost vertical cliff faces to reach their goal at the top. Provisions would be raised in baskets attached to ropes. They are now a little more accessible as staircases, in inverted commas, have been cut into the rock, but the ascent still requires time and effort, focus and determination. The monks though knew that the climb would come with a reward. They would get to a place of retreat, a place where they could withdraw from the hustle and bustle of the world, leaving down here behind and getting to a place of solitude, a place where they could look to higher things, the things of God, a place of prayer and of communion with God. And we see this idea throughout the Bible. It was from up a mountain that God showed Abraham the promised land. It was to a mountain that God sent him to test his faith with the sacrifice of Isaac. It was while up a mountain that God gave Moses the law and the commandments and later revealed himself in glory. It was up a mountain that Elijah went when he needed reassurance that God was still with him. And last week we heard of Jesus going up a mountain to be transfigured, having spent time in the presence of his father. It's a feeling that I'm sure we've all had in some small measure. Periods when we have had closeness with God, when we've had a new experience of him in which he has revealed himself a little bit more to us, when we have had a time of quiet rest and solitude where we've heard his voice or felt his touch. We know that we have to come back down the mountain and we pray that what we hold in our hearts stays with us when we reach the bottom. But so often we are back down here for such a short time before reality hits. There's some crisis at home or someone immediately challenges us or simply busyness. The world spoils the experience, takes away our peace. How do we cope with the realities of life that we come up against? Do we try to do things in our own strength? Do we know that we need help, but we decide to stay at base camp, so to speak, and dismiss the climb? But to do that, the blessing awaiting us would be missed. Or do we rely on the presence and the power of God? To rely on that power, we need to climb the mountain and we need to climb it again and again because we can't experience the presence of God, the revelation of who he is unless we make the effort to get into his presence. Mountaintop experiences are great things but the test of them is when we come back to the real world, 
to a broken and hurting world where the glory of God is so often hidden and obscured. Then the test for us is whether we remember and trust what we've discovered on the mountaintop. So this week, as we begin Lent, I encourage you to embark on a Lenten journey. A journey into the unknown, for we don't know where God will take us, just like Noah. Or it could be a Lenten climb, like the monks of the Meteora, a time when we can make a personal voyage of discovery to get to know our amazing God better. Getting to know this Jesus who loves us so much that he died to give us access to the place that he is preparing for us. The idea of any journey is that you end up in a different place to where you started. And in this instance, a different place spiritually. Lent is a time for reflection and prayer. It is the time that we can be real with ourselves, really examine ourselves and look at who we are now and who we want to be in Christ. So Lent this year could be a chance for us to focus on moving our spiritual position by spending time with our God who wants to change us if we let him, wants to develop our relationship by spending time together, wants to show us his love. Let's try, if we can, to ensure that even when it feels that we're not moving forward or achieving our goal of meeting with God in a new way, that we keep pushing on, that we keep climbing to that high place, that mountaintop place. For God is there. God is always there. And in seeking him, we may make an unexpected discovery about God that will change everything for us. Amen. We're going to um, sing another song now. It's about trusting in God, despite all that's going on around us, putting ourselves into his hands. And it's called Safe in the Shadow of the Lord. There are no voices for this, I'm afraid. It's an organ um, piece, but the words will be up for us to follow. There is a two line introduction at the beginning and then the verse will start. Thank you, Jeff.
we come to a time of prayer now. And I think in the current situation, there is just something that I'd like to share with you. Two things, actually. One is a picture that I was sent from a friend. He is a teacher and has students, um, one of whom is in Kyiv at the moment. And this student sent him a photograph last week, a picture that he'd taken over the skyline of Kyiv. Jeff has put that photo up on the screen for you now. I didn't know whether to show it, but everything that we've talked about is God's, today has been about God's angels taking care of us, protecting us, looking after us. And this picture over the city of Kyiv, I think really speaks to us. And over this picture, I'd like to read you something that has come out from the Iona community. And it goes like this. If I talk in the rhetoric of politicians and commentators, but I do not speak peace, I am but a beating drum. And if I know what tomorrow will bring and know the secrets of the universe, and if I trusted everyone, but I do not seek peace, I am empty. If I sold everything I have and donated it to the poor, and if I signed up to be an organ donor, but I did not share peace with those around me, I have wasted my chance to matter. Peace has no use by date. Peace is gentleness. Peace does not want what it does not have. Peace does not flex its muscles or play war games. Peace does not push others out of the way. Peace does not lust after another's country or cling to ancient grudges. It does not pout or hold its breath or kick its feet on the floor. It never plays false on anyone. Peace puts up with others' foolishness, sees the best in other people, seeks common ground with everyone and persists to the very end. Peace never gives up. The politicians will disappear into history. The talking heads will run out of words. The wisdom of all the experts will turn to dust. For we do not know how the story ends. And our best guesses are just that guesses. But when God's time finally comes, all the pieces of the puzzle will fit. Now, even though the mirror is fogged by the steam of heated words, I can see the faces of my brothers and sisters in humanity. In this time, I struggle to understand but the day will come when we realize we are in this thing called life together and can only truly live if we truly care for each other. Faith, hope and love are bedrocks of our lives. But what we need to craft right now is peace. Yesterday was, sorry, Friday was the World Day of Prayer. 
And in that service, God says to us, for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. To give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and you come and you pray to me, I will hear you. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. I will listen. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Let us pray together in our intercessions. Loving God, when will we ever learn? Holy and gracious God, we pray for the people of the Ukraine and the people of Russia, for their countries and for their leaders. We pray for all those who are afraid that your everlasting arms hold them in this time of great fear. We pray for all those who have the power over life and death, that they will choose for all people life and life in all its fullness. We pray for those who choose war, that they will come to know that you direct people to turn swords into plowshares and to seek peace. Lord, we pray for the world, suffering because some people believe that to put themselves first is the only wise way. We pray for the world's suffering because too many people cannot see the need for justice and the alleviation of want. We pray for world leaders, rulers of nations. We pray for the United Nations Treaty, for those with power and influence in our world. And we pray for ourselves that in our daily lives and work, we can pray at least. I trust in him. I trust in him who hears and answers prayer. Lord, we pray too for your church, struggling to cling to its essential faith in you in the face of all the chaos and scepticism and scorn that is around us. We pray for a church struggling to be a house and a people of prayer amidst the claims and the clamours of our everyday world. We pray for the church throughout the world. We pray for Christians and congregations everywhere, especially in places where their rights and their freedoms are taken away from them or curtailed by powers outside of their control. Lord, be with them. Enable 
your angels to protect them and guard them. I trust in him. I trust in him who hears and answers prayer. Lord, we pray for humankind searching, seeking for meaning and hope in lives that are clouded by want or suffering or loss, searching for truth and the right way to live with you, with one another and with ourselves. Lord, we pray for the sick, all those that we know that need your protection and your presence at this time. We pray for the bereaved and the anxious. And we pray for ourselves as we seek you in our daily lives and on our spiritual quest. I trust in him. I trust in him who hears and answers prayer. In the name of him who came to turn the values of this world upside down and to establish the values of the kingdom of love and justice and peace. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we we'll say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We come to our final hymn now, which the words are going to appear over this amazing picture of one of the monasteries that I was telling you about. At the name of Jesus, we believe that there will be a time when every knee will bow as we sing to God together.
and my I bless you in the name of Jesus today. As we travel on this journey of Lent, I pray that you will be able to seek the presence of God, that he will reveal himself to you in new and exciting ways. I pray that you can reach up and reach out to him so that a journeying on, you have a new understanding of who he is for you. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with each and every one of you and all those you love. Amen. We thank you for joining us this morning. You have been um, joining in the service of the Teambridge Methodist Circuit Churches in Devon. I just ask that God bless you all. May he put those angels of protection over each and every one of you and bless you greatly. <laughs>